uh, graduated from college, uh, put pen to paper, uh, was able to get 13 uh, investors to invest a modest amount of money to open up my first business. Uh, it was a cause that I had long dreamed of, uh, and it was an extraordinary two-year effort uh, to actually manifest. Uh, we opened that first business, a small little retail store in San Francisco, uh, with one part-time employee, Pat Kelly. Uh, that business grew uh, to many businesses throughout the state of California. Uh, at one point, uh, the businesses that I was privileged to be part of employed close to 1,000 people here in the state of California. I say that not to impress any of you, but to impress upon you a passion for entrepreneurialism, a passion uh, and recognition uh, of the passions that are expressed every single day by people that take an idea uh, and put their dream to test, to task, uh, and put their lives on the line, quite literally putting their financial future, their family members' future, co-signing loans, uh, making sure that they're leveraged uh, so they can get uh, a line of credit, uh, and putting all of that out. Uh, and then, of course, dealing with the travails, uh, even in a good economy, dealing with the setbacks, even in a good economy, the surprises, the things you never anticipated, uh, never expected. Uh, but of course, in this environment, with this pandemic, the challenges are more acute. Uh, and more extraordinary for millions and millions of small businesses throughout this state, for that matter, all throughout the rest of this country. And so uh, it's a long way of introducing an expression of deep reverence, deep respect uh, for our small businesses, deep respect, deep reverence for those that are working behind those counters, uh, not only as entrepreneurs, many self-employed, many with one or two employees themselves, but also the employees uh, that also are supported uh, by the backbone of our economy, our small business uh, ecosystem. And so I want to talk to you today. I want to talk more broadly uh, to the workforce, and I want to talk more broadly uh, to the economy here, the nation's fifth largest economy, the great state of California. You can't begin a conversation about economic development uh, and economic recovery without asserting what I think is universally uh, accepted, at least in the context of those experts that we work with and my own subjective beliefs and that belief. And that is the most urgent economic recovery tool for the business community, the one that we need the most is to stabilize this virus, to bend the curve of this pandemic, to do everything in our power to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. That's foundational. I don't think there is fundamentally anything more important for our economic future than this fundamental fact. In addition, we recognize that anything we do in terms of an economic paradigm uh, should be inclusive. We should be focused on resiliency, and not only related to pandemics, but more broadly, the macroeconomic uh, vagaries of an economy, the downs, uh, the highs, the lows, and the nature, the cyclical nature uh, of the economy, particularly uh, an economy that's so impacted by international conditions, the state of California. So we want to talk in terms of inclusivity. We want to talk in terms of resiliency, but we also want to talk in terms of the future. I'll talk a little bit in a moment about some of the work we're doing uh, on our Future of Work Task Force. When we talk about future-proofing uh, our economy, we're talking about some of the macroeconomic trend lines, and IT and globalization, demographic uh, trend lines, and the like, the plumbing fundamentally uh, of our economy radically shifting uh, underneath us. And that, of course, has been a trend line for decades. Increasingly, even pre-pandemic, became a headline uh, that has driven a recognition of this hinge moment and a need to be more fluid, uh, more responsive, uh, and more resilient in our rulemaking and our approaches to economic growth and economic security. Uh, any strategy also should be focused uh, on the immediate, the near term, obviously a focus mindful uh, on what may take a year or two in the medium term and always uh, on the long term, a sustainable, not just situational mindset as it relates to economic growth and economic prosperity. One of the most important actions we've taken recently here in the state of California was the development uh, of a 100-plus member Jobs and Economic Recovery Task Force, uh, led by some of our nation's top entrepreneurs, some of the, our nation's most uh, well iconic 
individuals from Tim Cook runs Apple uh, to Bob Iger runs Disney, two home-based companies, two companies we're very, very proud of. But the frame was not only growth. It wasn't just uh, highlighting uh, our entrepreneurs and our big business leaders. Uh, that task force is also about inclusion. And we have a big thrust as it relates to equity, a big thrust as it relates to economic justice, social justice, racial justice. And so it's a remarkable group of individuals that truly represents the diversity of our state, the diversity of viewpoints, the diversity of concerns and considerations as it relates to economic recovery. I just want to briefly highlight some of the work that they've been doing over the course of last number of months, uh, particularly helping us with our sector-specific guidance so that we can modify that original as we did stay-at-home order, put out sectoral guidance, industry guidance for a safer reopening. The task force has been instrumental in advancing those efforts. They were also instrumental of helping us raise tens of millions of dollars for our Wear a Mask campaign, also providing PSA, free uh, advertising uh, capacity, also providing us some of the creative uh, to advance that fundamental campaign that may be the most impactful in terms of getting uh, our businesses back open by mitigating the spread of this disease. We also launched the Shop Safe shop local uh, campaign, hashtag shop safe shop local to help support our small business, our micro businesses, our neighborhood businesses and encourage people uh, to uh, maintain uh, that support through this very difficult and trying time. We also had 90 members of that 100 member task force, which I can assure you was a remarkable uh, number of people that signed on to a letter uh, agreeing that we needed to advocate for more federal supports for federal stimulus dollars. Uh, this was around the times of the last CARE Act uh, fund, but also that letter is instrumentally pointed uh, at jumpstarting these current negotiations between McConnell and uh, Speaker Pelosi and others. Uh, we're not giving up uh, on Congress moving forward, uh, not just President through executive orders, but Congress moving forward to do the right thing in subsequent stimulus support. Uh, we also had the benefit from this task force of five subcommittees that have provided dozens and dozens of recommendations uh, that we have put into play in real time uh, and will be advancing uh, over the course of the next weeks, not just months, and I'll get to that in just a moment. Let me just talk about some specific actions we have taken to support the economy here in the state of California, already in play. We've already moved forward to simplify accounting method methods to reduce tax liabilities for most small businesses. I can get into the details of this, but I really want to get through a long list to give you a sense of the breadth, and in some cases, the depth of some of these efforts so you get a sense of uh, what we are trying to achieve here as a state and the support we're trying to provide. We also eliminated uh, through the budget, and I'm very grateful legislative support for this effort, uh, eliminated that $800 minimum franchise tax uh, for all new startups here in the state of California. So that franchise tax no longer applies for businesses that want to start uh, here in the state of California. We also have allowed small businesses to defer tax payments. This we did a number of months ago, uh, and this has been a very, very fruitful. Uh, up to 12 months and up to $50,000 of deferred sales tax payments. That's a big deal. Again, as a former small business owner, uh, I could deeply appreciate uh, cash flow concerns and issues. Uh, being able to defer for at least a year up to $50,000 is like getting a line of credit against those dollars that are owed uh, and being able to utilize them to pay rent, to pay your employees, to pay for uh, these extraordinary expenses and burdens that have been placed on you. We also extended the sales tax deadlines uh, during this pandemic as well. Accordingly, we have worked to support the economy by working, uh, by supporting working families. 3.6 million working families have already received a uh, billion dollars through our earned income tax program. Uh, I don't know another state that is providing more for working families. Uh, these are folks on the edge. These are people working hard. These are families in need. These are direct contributions in their pocket. We had a budget that just passed, those dollars being distributed in real time, over $1 billion in new tax credits, 3.6 million working families that got the benefit of those efforts. Accordingly, we advanced over just the last 24-month period, but I thought it was important to highlight 
uh, that we have advanced over a billion dollars, unprecedented in California's history, for low-income housing tax credits. And this all goes to jump-starting our economy, jump-starting housing production here in the state. You'll see those uh, line items here in this slide, 18 bills. Uh, that we advance and signed uh, with incredible leadership of the legislature, a package uh, that uh, we are very proud of uh, to move housing production forward last year. By no stretch of the imagination is that where we are ending our efforts on housing. Quite the contrary. I'll talk a little bit more about some of those efforts in a moment. Uh, but we are fully committed to doing more and better as it relates to housing production here in the state of California that's foundational in terms of our economic capacity, not just our ability to recover from this pandemic, but our ability to be competitive uh, in years to come. And so that's a little bit of a highlight on what we've done to support the economy. Let's talk specifically now the work we've done to support businesses. Uh, one of the programs we're very proud of, first in the nation, a novel program uh, where took that entrepreneurial mindset, took pen to paper of sorts and tried to bring it into government, that entrepreneurial mindset, worked with FEMA, uh, incredible leadership of FEMA, Bob Fenton and others, our regional director, created a program to support restaurants. 8,000 jobs have been supported. 5.6 million meals now have been served to seniors uh, that need to quarantine, need to isolate, that don't have other supports, that can't get Meals on Wheels, aren't getting other uh, meals delivered. Uh, this program not only helps our seniors, uh, but it has helped support these restaurants that have just been pummeled by this pandemic uh, and the challenges of opening and reopening all related uh, to the transmission of this disease. So first in the nation, Great Plates delivered program. It's paying dividends and I'm really proud of that program, proud of those partnerships uh, and proud of that effort, particularly now that we're seeing other states replicate this model. We've waived property tax penalties for small businesses and we created a new small business loan targeting minority and women-owned businesses, micro-loans. These are people that can't get those PPP loans, that couldn't get the SBA loans, uh, that are falling basically through the cracks, don't have commercial banking relationships, credit banking relationships, uh, and as a last resort, uh, need support. Some of that's first loss support, more access, liquidity to capital, forgive the language, be a little confusing, uh, but the bottom line is tens of millions of dollars. Uh, it's over 100 million now, but 75 million in new dollars that we put in to this place uh, and in this space to help our small businesses uh, and provide access and opportunity uh, for loans during this very difficult period of time. Accordingly, we've also fo focused our efforts on supporting organic businesses that preside or reside here in the state of California. We announced a number of weeks back a program called safelymakingca.org. Safelymakingca.org is a platform, I encourage you to take a look at it, uh, that encourages you to support small businesses, medium businesses, manufacturers here in the state of California. It is a fact we are still the largest manufacturing state in America. While manufacturing gets so much attention in other parts of this country, it deserves more attention here in the state of California. We worked with the Manufacturing Association to develop this program. Their incredible leader and leadership, uh, CMTA, uh, helped us conceive of this new platform. Hundreds and hundreds of small businesses procuring PPE, including N95 masks that we are actually purchasing from a business in Santa Clara, California that's reconstituted its line, a small business uh, that is growing in this pandemic, uh, developing tens of millions of N95 masks that we're procuring. Uh, the virtual cycle of sales tax uh, and dollars that flow uh, through that cycle of engagement with the state procurement uh, through the Office of Emergency Services into a county and a community creating jobs, creating opportunities, direct and indirect economic supports is exactly what we want to see more of. Trust me when I say this, this is a point of deep emphasis for us, but we have a new platform, we have new programs. Uh, we're not just proposing something in this space, we're actually manifesting something in this space, not at the scale we need to, but with real progress, not just promotion uh, behind this effort. Another program we've done that I'm very proud of uh, I long have been an advocate not just for unemployment insurance. I think we need to move towards an employment insurance 
program in this country. Something I did as mayor of San Francisco uh, through the last Great Recession, we got a waiver uh, uh, to do a program where we were able to hire employees. Many were getting actually less than they would uh, being on unemployment insurance, but they still went back to work for, well, three reasons, for dignity being the most important. Uh, they wanted to look, I remember meeting some uh, workers who said, you know what, the reason I took this job back through this employment insurance program and I didn't pick up an unemployment insurance check is that I wanted to look my kids in the eye and say that I earned these dollars. Uh, and that was a touching and profound statement. I think it was Voltaire uh, that uh, said, uh, work solves life's three great evils, boredom, vice, and need. Um, and I certainly uh, believe there is dignity with work and people naturally, uh, don't buy the rhetoric, you keep hearing on the national news that somehow uh, people are just takers and prefer just to take an unemployment insurance check and somehow we have uh, created a reverse stimulus in this country by providing those $600 uh, additional contributions on a weekly basis to your paycheck. That's nonsense. And by the way, overwhelming majority of studies on this bear that out as complete garbage. And so there is something about the dignity of work, dignity of being employed, that 99% of workers prefer. Uh, and I just want folks to know, we have a program called our WorkShare program. And already it's supported 54,000 employees. Uh, 8,400 employers have taken advantage of this program. And if you're an employer, I encourage you to do the same. You want to keep your employees employed? Reach out. Go to the covid19.ca.gov website, covid19.ca.gov website. Uh, learn more about this work share program already paying dividends. It is an employment insurance program. We employ your employees, so we keep them off the unemployment line, and it is a program uh, worth scaling and I believe worth mentioning here today. Accordingly, I want to just mention we have 86 active small business centers in the state of California, speaking over 31 languages. They have seen, not surprisingly, a tenfold increase in their financing assistance since the beginning of this pandemic, but it's also the backbone of our small business supports in the state, this network of small business centers. And I just want to thank all the employees working in those small business centers for all of their counsel work, their counseling work, all their uh, work just advising and supporting small businesses that have come in in record volume in the state. Encourage you as a small business person to consider reaching out, learning more about our small business centers uh, that are in your region and in your area. You can't talk about business. Uh, without talking about workforce. And so it is uh, incredibly important for us to highlight some of the work that has been done and some of the work we're going to be doing as it relates to supporting our essential workforce, essential workforce broadly defined by providing workers' compensation, which we did through this pandemic, the paid sick leave that we provided in this pandemic for our food service workers, the paid family leave uh, so people can care for uh, their children, uh, or uh, if they have a member of their family uh, that is quarantined, they need to have that paid family leave. We advanced efforts in this place. We also advanced efforts to support our frontline essential workers by providing more support through child care contributions, tens of millions of dollars we put in place to support those frontline workers to help them get child care so that they can stay uh, there on the front lines of that workforce at a time when we desperately needed them. We also created programs, you may recall, a hotel program where we subsidized hotel rooms for health care workers that otherwise were sleeping in their cars, were scared to death to go back home and expose their families uh, and were going out of pocket staying in hotel rooms or in some cases were in shelters as we discovered. And so we created a program to provide housing subsidies or rather hotel voucher subsidies uh, for that workforce. And we extended that to agricultural workers as well. We did cash assistance, uh, direct cash assistance through philanthropy and um, Chan Zuckerberg Foundation, among others, to help our skilled nursing facility workers. Uh, tens of millions of dollars in that space as well. Millions of masks. Talk about tens of millions. Tens of millions of masks. 
uh, PPE and other important gloves, gowns, face coverings we sent out to our essential workforce because we were able to procure hundreds of millions of procedure masks, surgical masks, and N95 masks through our large-scale uh, purchasing capacity. We did an eviction moratorium. We talked a little bit about that on Monday. Uh, I want to just thank Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court, members of the Judicial Council, to their credit, that are considering extending that moratorium uh, through the end of August. They haven't done so, and I'm not doing this to put pressure on them. I just want to thank them for their very constructive dialogue and engagement. That will give us time working with the legislature uh, to enact an extension of those moratoriums uh, and meet the needs for millions of Californians that are feeling the anxiety and stress in that space. We are also able to work with some of the largest big banks in the United States on mortgage forbearance. Uh, we negotiated that. I think we were one of the first states in the country to do so. Uh, and I want folks to know uh, that we are working aggressively behind the scenes, can't make any promises to see what we can do to extend some of the same uh, support. Look, no one's been more supportive than the California legislature. Uh, and I want to just thank legislative leadership uh, the pro tem, the speaker, some of the key legislative leaders, Bob Hertzberg and others, who've just been proactive and engaged and engaging on the issue of elevating ideas uh, and legislative supports to spur economic growth here in the state of California. We have just a couple weeks left, just, just over two weeks left in this legislative session. And so uh, we have to get to work. We have been at work, but we got to roll up our sleeves now and get this package across the finish line. So A, I want to acknowledge their leadership, all their incredible ideas, the work they've already done, the work we did together last year, uh, creating that foundation, a predicate for the work that is in front of us. Now let me talk a little bit about that work in front of us. And again, forgive me for being long-winded, perhaps speaking uh, a little bit more quickly, but I want to get through this presentation because I think it's incredibly important to many of you watching and those uh, that uh, will be supported through some of these efforts. Let's talk about these efforts. One of the most important things we can do, area where I th think we have clarity in terms of common ground with legislature, uh, is accelerating state-funded infrastructure investment. Uh, unspent bond monies uh, on well, projects that are ready to go. I always hesitate to say shovel-ready projects because uh, that connotes uh, some of the old stimulus after a wait. Uh, but we have a lot of projects that are ready to go that are permitted uh, and can happen. All we need to do is move that money out a little bit quicker, a little bit faster. Hundreds of millions of dollars, um, well, in excess of $400 million that readily we have identified to move in this space to accelerate state-funded uh, infrastructure investment to create jobs uh, in the immediate area. We're working with the legislature on, again, want to just thank uh, their leadership uh, for presenting ideas, uh, and we have confidence we can get some of these over uh, the, the finish line. Accordingly, we have a lot of work we want to do on wildfire and green infrastructure investment, hardening our energy grid, and we have strategies and plans Legislature has the same, and we think we have common ground and can advance some of those efforts. Workforce training, it's foundational, it's fundamental. Uh, we have been working with our economic uh, task force, uh, some of the nation's leading workforce development leaders are members of that task force, and they have come up with some really creative ideas on workforce training. The legislature has their ideas. Uh, we have some ideas around skills libraries. I don't want to get into some of the weeds, but we have some really innovative strategies, certification strategies, uh, where we're working with all the stakeholders, and I'm confident uh, we can get some of this done. We're making real inroads uh, in terms of finding some common ground in that space. You can't say enough about time value of money. As someone that years and years ago, I think it took a few weeks um, when I first applied for my business license to open a business, create jobs, create tax revenue for the state, and it took weeks and weeks and weeks to get a simple business license. That's absurd. And I recognize now my responsibility as governor uh, to make sure uh, that those weeks become days. And I want to just thank Alex Padilla, the Secretary of State. He's done an amazing job in the last few years reducing that time. Secretary of State plays a role 
in this as well as a lot of other state agencies. But we're not just talking about a simple license to operate. We're talking about licenses across the spectrum to adapt and adjust and amend uh, operations, particularly in this pandemic environment. And so we've got to streamline permitting. It doesn't mean eliminating rules and regulations and, and, and don't, don't read into that. Uh, it's just about you know time value of money. Just make a decision. Let me know what the rules of the road are. Don't let this linger one week, one month, some cases six, seven, eight months. So that's fundamental, and we have some sectoral streamlining strategies that are underway, and just want folks to know that this is a point of real commitment and resolve, uh, and we're going to be at this for years, but this is an area we are focused on, particularly now in hard-hit sectors of our economy uh, that are going to need most support to recover uh, from the last six months. can't recover unless you can recover uh, information, data. Uh, measure that data, be more customer service oriented in terms of how we provide services in the state. We talked about this on Monday uh, uh, across the spectrum, large scale IT, even medium, small scale IT needs to be improved in this state. Uh, we need to get, well, we need to meet you where you are. And that's not old mainframes that were designed in 1970. Uh, it's on your smartphones uh, where we can anticipate your needs. We can predict uh, where you'll be, uh, not just wait for your inquiry and respond. Uh, and that's why we created this Office of Digital Innovation. And uh, that's why we're putting together uh, a, a band of people that are committed uh, to the cause of innovation and an entrepreneurial spirit, breaking down silos and barriers uh, and processes to do more and do better to meet your needs in a more efficient and effective way. And so I included that because I think that's foundational in terms of our economic future, in terms of our workforce uh, as well. Look. One thing we know, uh, businesses are having a hard time that are on the edge of making a decision whether or not they can afford to hire someone. And so we want to make that a little easier, working again with legislative leaders to develop a, a new hiring uh, tax credit. A lot of good ideas from the legislature. We have our ideas. Our task force presented uh, some new ideas as well. We refer to it as a Main Street hiring credit because we really want to focus on small business. And when I say small business, I mean not just small businesses with 500 or 1,000 employees, um, but small businesses, one or two employees, self-employed, uh, that may want to hire a part-time person or may want to hire a full-time person, may want to hire someone who's formerly homeless, may want to hire someone uh, that just came out of the criminal justice system. And while we have some programs in this place, we want to do more and do better to advance a more comprehensive hiring credit, particularly on sectors of our economy that have been most impacted by this pandemic. We also want to work, legislatures come up with some really good ideas. We very much uh, support some of those ideas to conform to the federal PPP taxation. Uh, this is the federal loan program. Uh, we want to exempt uh, that loan program for California-based businesses from state taxation, just an area where there's been real leadership. And uh, I think Autumn Burke, among others, uh, have bills on this. Uh, and I want to, if I get into the details of everyone who has a bill, I'm going to get in trouble for those I didn't mention. Uh, but I just want to thank the legislature for their work in this space, and, and we're working uh, to see what we can do to, uh, to make sure these bills are successful. Workers' protection, we talked about this, uh, well, 10 or so days ago in Stockton, California. I followed up here um, a few days later talking about the work we need to do to our essential workforce and how disproportionate this impacts the Latino community and the black community here in the state of California. We need to advance more worker protections. Look, if we're going to eliminate this disease. We want people that have tested positive or been exposed to COVID-19. We need them to isolate. We need them to quarantine. But if you can't afford to quarantine, you can't afford to isolate, you physically don't have the ability to do that at your home, uh, you need protections. And that's why workers' protections are foundational. Family lead, paid sick leave, workers' comp. It's the only way we're going to succeed here. And so for businesses, this is essential. It's not just for workers to reopen, but for businesses, it's essential that their workers are healthy and safe and not coming to work because they need that paycheck sick and then impacting the entire company and impacting the ability for that organization to continue to operate. So we see this 
as something that's very connected uh, to the business community and business needs. Also, we want to help uh, with our outreach, and I mentioned some of the work we've done in this space in terms of the employee toolkits, employer toolkits, know your rights campaigns, all of this culturally competently uh, delivered throughout the state of California so that employees that are entitled to a lot of these programs that actually pay in to these programs are aware that they're entitled to them and, and they don't have any retaliation. It's always an exception. But, you know, we've got to address uh, people that may be a little more abusive to those workers and their rights and make sure that those workers are empowered and aware. Uh, and that's part and parcel uh, of our efforts to protect workers to more quickly and expeditiously reopen this economy and beyond even this pandemic. Big awareness campaign, public awareness campaign. We want to continue to do that. More specificity, more nuance as we turn the page. And I'll get to the latest numbers in a moment. And some of the trend lines are moving in the right direction. Uh, how we can more effectively target our public awareness campaigns. I also want to uh, acknowledge all those caregivers out there. Um, this is personal, uh, my wife, uh, among others, but it's also a cause. Uh, my administration holds dear, Chief of Staff, Anna Leary, among many others, but I know legislative leaders care deeply about caregiving care economy, which we need to highlight, uh, domestic workers and the like. This pandemic's had a real impact on their lives. There's a lot of legislative conversations in this space. I want to acknowledge them, thank uh, them for introducing more formally some strategies for consideration. We want to work together on those efforts. Accordingly, we also need to protect consumers. Uh, we have, as part of our package uh, we introduced earlier this year, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, California can lead in this space, uh, and I think it's foundational uh, to uh, protecting workers, to protecting a more sustainable framework uh, to reopen our economy uh, that, again, advantages everybody. And so we want to continue to work closely with the legislature in that space. I mentioned evictions a moment ago and the work we're doing um, uh, in that space in the past, the work we've done with the Judicial Council and hope uh, is enacted by the Judicial Council to give us a few more weeks to put together a legislative package. I mentioned this on Monday, some of the work being done in this space. Uh, again, I want to just thank a number of legislative leaders uh, for their uh, specific ideas and uh, we continue to have very constructive, including yesterday, constructive conversations in this space. Uh, and we will update you uh, as, uh, as is warranted uh, on that progress. I don't want to get in the way of the negotiation right now of talking out of school except to say uh, that we are committed uh, to getting something done over the course of the next few weeks on eviction protections and addressing the needs of our most vulnerable renters and small landlords as well. And speaking of that, one of the ideas that we are committed to is accelerating the distribution of the $300 million in our national mortgage settlement funds. Uh, the original budget proposed that we would spend that down over the course of a number of years, $75 million in this year. Um, but we now want to accelerate that, uh, and we're proposing putting all $300 million out this year to address the needs, again, of our most, uh, well, most vulnerable homeowners and renters. Uh, so this is to really help small landlords, uh, to help renters uh, and, and homeowners uh, that have been impacted, uh, all within the spirit, the letter of the law, of the settlement related to the mortgage funds, by the way, uh, led by then Attorney General Kamala Harris. Uh, we want to thank her. Wouldn't be having this specific conversation without her leadership in this space. Uh, and this is just a demonstrable example of that leadership and how important it is to come uh, at this time. And so we want to accelerate those funds. And uh, I think uh, we have a lot of support with the legislature in that effort. Accordingly, can't talk about economic growth, economic recovery, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, without talking about housing. Uh, no greater economic stimulus, the virtual cycle of housing growth, housing production, housing starts. Uh, we did a lot of things last year on infill infrastructure grants and more money. I mentioned billion dollars the last few years in tax credits. Uh, we also have the ability to move some of our bond funds in this space uh, and move those dollars, distribute those dollars sooner. And so we are working with the legislature to do just that. I want to thank, again, the legislature for their efforts in this space and, and know that uh, we are very committed. We've identified 
well over $100 million in this space uh, to move quickly and efficiently and effectively out there. Uh, accordingly, uh, we have a lot of bills in the legislature, and I just want to thank you know, the pro tem, among others, that have bills on moving housing production, which just simply means, you know, get housing built faster. Uh, can't be more clear about that. A uh, number of bills. Um, I don't want to attach to any one bill. We're negotiating uh, those points. But uh, the time value of money also includes the time to actually start construction. Uh, once you identify a piece of property, line up the financing, get through all the local permits, the regional permits, the state permits, any federal barriers, and then you've got to go. I mean, it's a labyrinth. And so we have an obligation, uh, economic obligation, but also, I would argue, an ethical one in the context of how housing prices have ravaged the economy in the state over decades and how we simply have not produced enough housing in the state over the course of decades. We have to address that, and I think some of these bills uh, will move in that direction with caveats, with amendments, with considerations, all stakeholders at the table. Final couple points I want to make, and I'll jump briefly into today's data and then answer any questions, uh, is later this week we'll be putting out more detailed plan on closing the digital divide. It's clear that reforms in the economic space also need to address and adapt to the reality of this pandemic and the conditions this pandemic has created. Digital divide as it relates to education, that's obvious and foundational, but also as it relates to the economy broadening access to tablets, uh, broadening access to uh, broadband is fundamental. It's not just access to broadband, it's high quality, uh, high speed broadband that's also fundamental. And so we'll be putting out more details in that space later this week, but I wanted to just point them out here today, uh, as well as recognizing we're doing a lot more telework. Uh, what are the rules of engagement on telework for employees and employers? And so we're looking in that space as well, and I want to telegraph that as it relates to teleworking in this state, uh, that we need to, uh, I think, uh, get under the hood and uh, consider uh, some strategies of flexibility uh, that meet the needs and the rights and our responsibility to protect employees. At the same time, recognize uh, these new tools of technology, new tools of engagement uh, require perhaps some new thinking. Speaking of new, uh, you see here briefly, and I'll jump through just very briefly these numbers, uh, a number, 11,645, it's the total number of COVID cases that we're reporting in the last 24-hour period here in the state. Now, I mentioned on Monday that this week, over the next you know, few days, um, up to 72 hours through tomorrow night, most likely, uh, that we will take all of that backlog, the 295,000 backlog numbers cases, figure out the total number of positives we have, and then begin to stack those positives on the actual dates those numbers came in. So we're beginning to do that. But for the purpose of transparency, yesterday, 12,500, today, 11,645, we're giving you numbers that represent the actual number of positive cases and a number that begins the process over a few day period of truing up the total number of positives from that backlog. If you're following me, I'm impressed and grateful. It's a long-winded way of saying that the actual numbers uh, today that we are putting out, the 11,645, includes 6,212 backlogged cases, and the actual number today is 5,433. So backlog numbers will come in next couple days. Uh, we will then get through all of that. We'll true up all these numbers. We'll get a brand new positivity rate out there for everybody. Uh, but no, all that is happening, happening on the schedule uh, that, uh, that we promoted uh, on Monday uh, and just wanted for transparency purposes to give you a sense of uh, how many backlog numbers we just added today, but give you a sense that I think is a little bit more optimistic, the 5,400 too high, uh, but a lot lower than we've been tracking the last few weeks. Again, another indication that we are turning the corner on this pandemic. Briefly, let's uh, follow that up with some other proof points. Hospitalizations, uh, these are the facts. These are the grounding numbers, hospitalizations, ICUs, deaths. These are the lagging indicators, uh, and these numbers 
obviously very consequential. It's very encouraging still to see the 14-day hospitalization numbers continue to decrease over 19%, I think 19.3, 19.4% decrease in the last 14 days. Consequence, that decrease, you saw that on Monday, you saw it last week, the week prior, seen a decrease in hospitalizations. That number now, 5,442, represents about 7% of the healthcare system capacity uh, in the state. Nine, eight, now down to about 7% of the capacity. It relates to ICU admissions. Uh, you see a similar trend line, uh, a little even more encouraging than last week, uh, rather on Monday, last presentation on ICUs, now 16% decrease on ICU admissions over a 14-day period. So tracking similarly uh, to the decreases we're seeing, 19% in hospitalizations. As a consequence, again, looking at total capacity, that pie chart, critical care capacity, ICU capacity now was 23%, 22 now about 20% of the total number of ICU patients, COVID-19 positive patients in our high C ICU uh, system. Ventilators, again, uh, north of 13,000 available, uh, doing better uh, than we were a few weeks ago with 11,000 plus ventilators uh, available. As always, again, appreciate you sticking in with me on this presentation. Um, as always, we encourage you to wear a mask. Want to see those numbers continue to go down? Wear a mask. Want to see those numbers continue to go in the right direction, continue to physically distance. We want to see those numbers continue to go down as the temperatures go up. Try to avoid mixing. You know, I was, saw the American River the other day, and I, I might as well have been at spring break. Thousands and thousands of people. Um, we're not minimizing mixing. It kind of raised little shivers in my spine that here we are making all this progress, and it could be done away. And, you know, a day two, a week two, people begin again to let their guard down. You can't let your guard down. Got to continue to practice all of these fundamental uh, rules of the road as it relates to what we know works, non pharmacal interventions to mitigate the spread of this disease, including washing your hands. Uh, but then again, more important than wearing a mask. And so I want to encourage you uh, to do uh, just that. Uh, final point I just want to say on, on businesses. And I have a mantra, it's a bias, and forgive me, it is a bias. Um, but that bias uh, I wear, again, through personal experience, not just intellectualization, as governor of the state of California cares deeply about economic growth and economic prosperity. Uh, and that mantra is simple, that you can't be pro-job and anti-business. And I think it's just fundamental that when we talk about job growth and job creation, that we support our small businesses. We support uh, those folks that, that take risks and put everything on the line. The second point I want to make is businesses can't thrive in a world that's failing. And that's also fundamental. And so if it is indeed a truism that you can't be pro-job and anti-business and businesses can't thrive in a world that's failing, then we have to recognize that the new paradigm on economic growth is growth and inclusion. And that's the foundation. That's the framework to which uh, we believe the values of the state of California are advanced, our principles are advanced, and long-term sustainable economic recovery can be found. Growth and inclusion. And so in conclusion, I wanted to make that point and uh, thank Everybody on our task force, thank everybody in the legislature for all of their ideas in the business community, for their ideas in cities, large and small, all across the state that have submitted their ideas to help us uh, in the pursuit of these efforts and close uh, to open up for questions by saying one final point. That list, while for many of you seemed exhaustive and exhausting, is not an entire list of ideas that we are currently considering and negotiating with the legislature. There are a number of very potent, powerful, and very insightful ideas that are being promoted by members of the legislature that are not on that list that we continue to engage uh, on. And I just want to acknowledge that and let you know that uh, it is not intentional 
that neglect. I just wanted to put together a list today where I think we've made a lot of progress, but no, that is by no means uh, an exclusive list of the considerations uh, that we are advancing over the course uh, of this legislative session that concludes on August 31st. With that, I've concluded my presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Ashley Zavala, Cron 4. Hi, Governor. I'll get this question out of the way, but I just wanted to see if you considered who you might appoint to take Kamala's seat if she's elected and what that process looks like for you should you have to make that decision. My Last I looked, it's August of 2020, and my understanding is in January, through the end of January 2021, that decision would need to be made. That's a way of saying this. It's not a way of being flippant. Uh, it's a way of being factual uh, and very transparent, absolutely focused on bending this curve, mitigating the spread of this disease, getting our economy moving again, getting people back to work, getting our kids, including, dare I say selfishly, my kids, back to school uh, and getting back to a semblance of normalcy uh, and looking forward uh, to turning the page as a nation uh, and working very, very closely with my old friend of over a quarter of a century, uh, the next Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. Adam Beam, AP. Governor, when it comes to the, uh, evic the temporary eviction rules uh, that the Judicial Council could set to expire on September the 1st, um, it, it, isn't it likely that any bill the legislature passes won't take effect until January 1st, so we might have a gap there? And I'm wondering if, if that's the case, would you issue an executive order to extend those protections to the end of the year? We have urgency capacity with the legislature, so the answer is there's a way of addressing that. Uh, but let me also just make this point. Uh, we were able to take executive action through the emergency uh, orders that are afforded to me during this pandemic uh, right now, uh, and that we've done that, and we advanced those same uh, orders in terms of capacity uh, that we provided the Judicial Council to do the same, they did. Uh, but right now, we are working in the spirit of collaboration, cooperation, partnership with the legislature and a lot of stakeholders on some nuances uh, that I think are incredibly important to work through. And so I'm, I'm confident that we'll get to where we need to go, but I'm very cognizant, and I think it's a very good question, very cognizant of that timeline, and that's why we're hoping it does get extended to September 1st, uh, that will give us the opportunity to move with the urgency that's required and to do so in a way where we can address that concern around a gap uh, by January 1st. So we are working through that uh, and we have a pathway, uh, we believe, to put something in place uh, that would work very nicely through that September 1st deadline. Alexi Kosev, SF Chronicle. Hi, Governor. Um, you know, you said again today that you're optimistic about the trend of where the infections are heading and, and it looks like the state is turning the corner. Could you um, specify a bit more about what you mean? What, what are you seeing that makes you optimistic? And do you think we're turning the corner enough that you can start considering a plan to reopen the businesses that have been forced to shut down again a second time? through the recent orders that you've made. Yeah, so let me bring up the slide on hospitalizations. This is what gives me some confidence we're moving in the right direction. Uh, we have COVID-19 hospitalization numbers that again have decreased 19% over the course of the last 14 days. The last four presentations that I've made, public presentations, you've seen similar decline in hospitalizations. Uh, after significant growth, you may recall a month or so ago, uh, it was a very, very difficult period, early July, where we saw hospitalization growth uh, over a 14-day period, north of 50%. Now we're seeing declines in hospitalizations. Accordingly, in ICU admissions, trend lines uh, are favorable. So specific to your question, uh, these are specific proof points uh, that connect to some optimism that what we are doing as a state, and I say we, the people of the state of California, 40 million strong. What you are doing is working. Wearing those face masks is responsible, I believe, disproportionately for this trend line. Socially distancing, physically distancing, responsible 
for this trend line, people that are becoming more cognizant of mixing outside of their households, more cognizant of letting down their guard even within their household. You're responsible. They are responsible for these trend lines. The worst mistake we can make, I've said this in the past, is run the 90-yard dash where we think we've got this and we walk away and we revert back to the way things used to be. And that's why we have to be very cautious and very deliberative as we begin the modification. Now, you specifically asked, in addition to what gives you some optimism, including, by the way, the total case rates. I'm going to give you the new positivity numbers. I want to make sure those are 100 percent accurate when we work through the details of that backlog that's forthcoming. Uh, but you also uh, note uh, that we have been consistently engaged and I mentioned this in the outset of the presentation today with our recovery task force on sectoral guidelines for safely reopening. We did that when we put up guidelines. We've been doing that consistently, working with health officials all up and down the state of California. And we are consistently iterating. We are consistently modifying those orders. Just recently, we put out new orders as it relates to sports, high school sports, youth sports, broadly defined club sports. We put it out for higher education. We are constantly making adjustments, mitigating based upon factors and criteria and conditions. We continue to work uh, with our advisory committees, continue to work with health officials. Uh, and a big part of these efforts moving forward, when, not if, when we make subsequent modifications uh, to uh, these sectoral guidelines is a commensurate effort with much more focus, much more intention, and more deliberative mindset than was the case a number of months ago when we did the original modifications of public education and awareness around the power and potency of continuing, continuing, even if we reopen a sector of our economy, continuing to enforce a consciousness, literally and figuratively, enforce a consciousness of promotion of these efforts to mitigate the spread and transmission of disease. Because one thing we know is this can flare up in a moment. And there is no having made it as it relates to being successful in this space as it relates to transmission of this disease unless and until we get a vaccine, unless and until we have the kind of therapeutics that can significantly mitigate the impacts of this disease. And so until that point, even if we modify, we have to maintain our vigilance and we'll need a commensurate public awareness campaign, an enforcement campaign uh, with any subsequent modifications to ensure that. Michelson, Fox 11. Governor, uh, as you mentioned, you've known Kamala Harris for a very long time. The country is now getting to know her and think about her in a different way. I'm wondering if you can share some insight on what she's like behind the scene, what the nature of your relationship is like with her. And although you're not thinking about a replacement, I'm curious if anybody has already started to pitch themselves as a replacement to you. Well, you may be the only one that hasn't, um, unless you just did. Um, and that is only slight exaggeration. Um, and uh, I can't be more pointed uh, privately than I am being publicly. That's not what I'm focused on right now. I'm focused on what I need to be focused on, and that's you and your health. That's the economy and its needs and the support that we need to provide small businesses and the priority to get our kids back in school. Uh, that's what matters to you, and uh, that's what matters to me as my top priority. Look, it relates to, I, I, don't, I don't want to belabor um, uh, and get into too much personal issues, but, uh, you know, I, as you said, or I said, thank you for reflecting on it, that I've known um, Kamala Harris before uh, she was district attorney in San Francisco, before I became mayor. Uh, we, of course, served, were elected the same day when she was district attorney when I was mayor. Uh, I had the privilege of working with her for two terms uh, when she ran for attorney general to be a supporter and an advocate for her campaign. I ran myself with lieutenant governor, worked with her as attorney general, I supported her efforts very proudly so when she uh, ran for the U.S. Senate and now as governor, been working very collaboratively in a very supportive way uh, with her team and with her in the United States Senate. I all accordingly and not surprisingly, based upon that history, based upon that relationship uh, and in my, um, my, my insight 
uh, in terms of the character and the competency uh, and her devotion uh, to the cause that I think unites the vast majority of us, her empathy, her compassion, her, her, her learnedness, her doggedness, her commitment uh, to solving problems, not just identifying problems, her executive experience, not just legislative experience, uh, made it an easy decision uh, when she announced uh, her campaign for president uh, for me to come out and endorse her. Couldn't be more proud of that. And so you can imagine uh, how proud I'm feeling, American people are feeling, not just Democrats. I have a few Republican friends that actually had a smile on their face yesterday um, about uh, her candidacy uh, now for the next vice president. So uh, it is a proud moment, historic, uh, and it's a very meaningful, I'll close on this, forgive me, meaningful moment for California. Um, you know, I'm privileged. I sit at a desk uh, that uh, Earl Warren sat at, former, by the way, assistant uh, district attorney in Alameda County where Kamala Harris started, um, obviously made his way to governor and became uh, Supreme Court justice. Where Ronald Reagan sits, I, you know, it's a proud place to sit there where, you know, great work was done by Pat Brown and Jerry Brown, among many others, Schwarzenegger, and proud of the work uh, in partnership now with Davis Wilson and others that have been incredibly uh, supportive. Uh, California has a proud history uh, of electing some outstanding leaders. Uh, and I gotta say, also a point of pride, not just being a Californian, uh, but you know, growing up in San Francisco. And uh, a lot of these leaders emanate from San Francisco. And if you followed uh, San Francisco politics, you know it's not for the timid. And it doesn't surprise me at all that so many of our nation's great leaders, uh, Nancy Pelosi being top among them, emanate from that extraordinary city, uh, the birthplace of my kids, my father, my grandfather, uh, not only myself. Andrew Schieber, Sack B. Hi, Governor. Thank you for your time. Uh, so there's, you know, four and a half million people who have lost um, the $600 a week uh, extra unemployment. Uh, and I'm just wondering what, what's next for them? What do you, what do you have to say uh, to them? And, and what is your uh, plan going forward with that? We talked a lot about that on Monday. I put out specific slides and presentations on Monday uh, of what it would take to draw down uh, that $300, uh, that was the original proposal based upon the executive order the president put out uh, to receive uh, the federal support, uh, the supplement on the unemployment insurance. I, I commented that it would cost the state about $2.8 billion a month, $2.8 billion a month uh, to meet uh, the rules and regulations that were assigned to that original executive order. Yesterday, as you know, it's been well reported, uh, there was a modification uh, to the executive order, at least an assertion uh, that there would be guidelines forthcoming to modify it, where it's no longer a $400 contribution, 600. We believed it to be 400. 25% would have to be picked up by the state. We talked about how that was simply not possible for the state, even as large as ours, to be able to do. Uh, now that 400, 600, 400, it's now dropped to 300. One thing we are doing is, as they say, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Now, I don't look as a gift horse. We're federal taxpayers. I'm a taxpayer. You're a federal taxpayer as well. Uh, this is what federal government is all about, time of need, meeting the needs of the American people. Uh, this is when we're all in it together. And traditionally, those needs are met by forwarding money from the federal government that has a printing press. States simply do not. Uh, to provide for the needs of the American people in the most direct and impactful way. Uh, and we were very proud and pleased and very thankful uh, of Congress, the President, uh, for endorsing the CARES Act, for getting that $600 contribution. I, I think it substantially mitigated uh, the economic consequences of this pandemic. I think it substantially aided the capacity for businesses to remain over because of consumer spending and consumer confidence, even during that difficult period of time uh, that maintained itself at a level that it otherwise would never have. Uh, I think it is a historic blunder if we are unable to accommodate the needs of tens of millions of Americans with subsequent supplemental on unemployment insurance. And I believe personally uh, and professionally that $300 is simply inadequate to do that 
to help support small businesses, to help support economies large and small across state, and very directly help support individuals and their families that are vulnerable to evictions and vulnerable to bill collectors, vulnerable in this climate. And so we continue to advocate for more federal support. We continue to be strong and assertive, and I take a back seat to no one going back months in advocating uh, for uh, a new CARES Act, supporting state and local government, as well as individuals related to the unemployment insurance um, efforts. Uh, and we'll continue to make our voice heard. I had a very good, very detailed, very comprehensive call with Speaker Pelosi yesterday on this topic specifically in answer to your question of what are we doing. Uh, and know this, forgive the long-windedness, uh, that we are working uh, with our team, if indeed, the gift horse comment, we only get $300, how we can process that $300 as quickly and efficiently as possible. So at least we get those dollars out uh, as we wait for either a deal with the current administration or a deal with the next administration in January. Here's the report back. The ability to do so can happen relatively easily, relatively easily. You go from 600 to 300 if the rules of the requirements do not change, meaning the rules for eligibility don't change. The unfortunate part is in the executive order that has now been changed, the eligibility rules have also changed. And when you introduce new eligibility rules into these ancient systems, and trust me, California is not the only one, it creates a processing problem that can delay the distribution of these checks. And you know this well, because you've seen governors of all political stripes make this crystal clear to the administration. So we are also encouraging the administration. We've made it clear to our partners at FEMA, uh, and we have made it clear to a lot of our federal partners that if you're going to move forward, if you want these dollars to have the impact that you intend them to have, we're grateful to take those dollars. We happily will accept them. We believe they're not enough, but you can't change the eligibility rules in a way that will impact our capacity to get these dollars in the pockets of people that need them the most as quickly as we otherwise could. Andrew Hart, Kaiser Health News. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Um, I wanted to ask you, we understand that you didn't have the full extent of the Cal Ready problems until a couple of Mondays ago, but have you had any indication or received any indication that Cal Ready wasn't up to the task? Um, and what about future problems with the system? Do you have any plans to try and replace this if the flaws continue? Yeah, we talked a lot about that on Monday. Dr. Galley talked even more detailed last Thursday and last Tuesday. Um, and forgive me, uh, just in the spirit uh, of uh, the work that was presented and work that has been done, including uh, some that we socialized on Monday, uh, we made it crystal clear uh, that our commitment is not just to piecemeal a solution, and we have now addressed the backlog, we made that clear on Monday, but to build a new strategy, a parallel strategy, and I also mentioned this Monday, uh, to create uh, a separate system on top of CalReady. Now it's connected, but that would absorb a COVID-19 focus uh, in a forward-minded way. It is clear the CalReady system just simply does not have the capacity uh, to scale as we had hoped for. Uh, we will reform that. We have mitigated uh, that as we speak. We will reform that in the medium term uh, with this parallel strategy, and then in the long term, uh, we have Amy Tong and others uh, that run our technology department uh, that are putting together a package of longer-term reforms to make sure uh, that we're not back in this situation, the next governor is not back in the situation, that we have a legacy of learning from these challenges and fixing them once and for all. Well, I believe that may have been the last question. Thank you all for your time and your patience. Thank you again for your vigilance. Thank you all for doing what you can and what you have uh, to mitigate the spread and to see this uh, transmission uh, begin to subside modestly. We continue uh, to encourage you to be vigilant, stay safe, 
uh, obviously stay healthy uh, and stay ever vigilant about how easy this disease can transmit itself. Uh, thank you all for the privilege of your time. Look forward to coming back, talking next couple of days, a little bit more about Digital Divide, updating you on all of these numbers and more. Take care.